Uh, definitely, definitely don't applaud yet. I, so I, I can't decide on a text editor. So I'm trying, I'm trying Emacs. Uh, I usually use Vim quite religiously, but hopefully this will, uh, this will suffice. Let me just see if I kill that and then I start it again. Yeah, good enough. Whatever. All right, cool. So this is going to be a talk on promises. Of the people who are here now, how many people use promises in their day-to-day -day development? Okay, so about half. It'll be interesting to see, this is going to start a little bit slowly and then it'll ramp up. So it'll be interesting to see how many people continue getting the, uh, the answers to these questions. It's kind of like a quiz. There are 24 things that I'm going to cover here, starting from you've never seen a promise before, all the way through to this is async, await, and what the semantics and syntax are underneath all of that. So starting simply, can anyone tell me what this function prints out when I call it? Let's, uh, let's see. Yeah, there we are. Nope, it prints out use node 7. <laughs> Which just goes to show you that the I-O monad is really important. Um, okay, so this prints out one, and it's fairly uh, established why that is. We have a function, we enter the function, we evaluate an expression, it logs to the console, and that's what happens. Uh, so leaving that aside, who can tell me what this function prints? It prints two twice, two twice. Okay, so again, we have this, we have this uh, semantic in node of an error back. We have a semantic where to have some asynchronous control flow, we include in our function a last parameter or a last argument to the function, which is a callback. And when our long running evaluated statement finally finishes, we call back the provided function with whatever the, uh, the result of the computation was, or we call back with some error that occurred. So that's, uh, that's setting up what happens here. Who's not seen the promise constructor before? Couple of people. All right, so the way to think about what a promise is, is it's a value that tells you that there is an asynchronous computation taking place. So the idea with promises is that we don't have a primitive in, in JavaScript or before the, promise, uh, before the promise type. We didn't have a primitive data structure as part of the language and as part of the runtime to let us know that there was an asynchronous computation taking place. So you might have a function that has a callback as its last parameter, and you call that callback when something finishes, but you don't know that the evaluation taking place inside that function is actually deferred by the event loop. You don't actually know where the, uh, where the process of running that function is taking place. So a promise is a, it's a type, or a type, it's a structure in JavaScript that encodes the fact that inside this promise, some delayed evaluation is taking place. A promise is a constructor. It's uh, one of the ES5 new constructor things, uh, as opposed to just an object or using object.create. And it takes a function as a callback. And the function that it takes, takes two functions as arguments, a resolve and a reject. And you can use these functions inside your promise to call back in the same way that you would use an error back at the end of a, a callback function. Uh, you can use these to call back when your promise is finished to signal that you've finished processing something and you're ready to move on to whatever your next area of computation is. So, who can tell me what this logs to the console? Promise. Have a, promise. a promise? Nothing, because we're not logging anything. There's no log as part of that statement. What about this? Three, all right, so three. So what's happening here? We have this function three, and three returns a new promise. And the new promise constructor takes a function, resolve and reject, and calls resolve with whatever the value that was passed into the function is. We then have here 
an invocation of the function. We call the function with the parameter 3. And we have a dot then method, which we haven't seen before. And inside that dot then method, we call console.log. This is the same as anyone who's familiar with uh, uh, um, arrow syntax. This is the same as calling that. So what we have here is a new, a new construction. A function that returns a promise, or a promise that, return, a promise that uh, exists as a type, as a type by itself, has a method dot then that takes an argument and will apply that argument when the promise is resolved. What else can we do with promises? Well, we can sometimes return, we can sometimes resolve and sometimes reject. So if we have four and we give four something greater than five, so we give four six. These are terribly named, I'm very sorry. If we give four six, what would this print? Six. What if we give four something less than six, uh, less than five, in fact? What if we give four four? What does this print? Exception. Exception? Nothing? 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 Exception? All right. Depending on which version of Node, <laughs> and depending on which version of Chrome, and depending on which version of V8 or Chakra or whatever the, the JavaScript engine is, this either prints this really useful thing, which tells you that you didn't handle an error case, or it prints a really unuseful thing, which is it does nothing, because according to the spec, it doesn't really have to do anything at this point. <laughs> Okay, now you can tell who's using which version. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, so what we have here is a new function that we can add here. Let's do it, let's do it the uh, explicit way first. We have a function here called dot then. We've already seen that you can give dot then a function to run when the promise resolves. Dot then actually takes two arguments. It takes a first argument to call when the promise resolves, and a second argument to call when it rejects. I won't use the bind syntax. What I'll do here is show when we have an error, we can call console.log with uh, error O with that error. Okay? So what should this print now? Hmm? Oh, yes. What should that would have printed a different error, a totally different syntax. So this will now print whoa. Ah, yep. So I said learning learning a new editor while I'm giving a talk. So this prints out the string error and what we passed into the function. And that's what happens. We reject the argument to the function from the promise. And so when we pass in the function to handle the rejection case, that's what it calls. But there's a very, very subtle semantic here that is not being handled. Am I handling that somewhere else? Yes, I am. Okay, I'll come back to that in a second. Before I get into that, I want to show you a couple of shortcuts. Of the people who are using promises daily, how many of you end up wrapping ordinary values with promises in order to use them in a chain somehow? A couple. How many of you do that using the promise.resolve method? Not everyone. How many people do use it with return new promise resolve the value that you want to use? One, two, a couple. Okay, so there's a shortcut method to return new promise re uh, resolve reject, which is you can actually just call the promise uh, constructor. A static method on that class is resolve. And what resolve will do, resolve is exactly the same as if you had written return new promise, take resolve and reject, and resolve with x. These two statements are basically the exact same thing under the hood. So what we have here is a shortcut that if I ever have an ordinary value, but I have some chained operations I want to perform on that value, I can take that value, inject it into a promise, and then use everything after that as if it was a promise. So if I have something like 5, we'll give it 5 this time. I think I'm, I think I'm learning how not to confuse the function names and the arguments. We'll give 5, 5, and then we'll take the response from the function, and we'll do console.log, and we'll return that, and we'll call here console.log. So what's, uh, what's printed out here? 5, 6. 5, 6. Five, six. 
Okay, so the reason for that is whatever you return from inside a dot then method is automatically passed on to the next dot then. So you can chain uh, similar to uh, well, similar to a few other behaviors in JavaScript, you can actually chain methods and keep adding behavior to this. So if I wanted to have uh, a string here, I could, uh, sorry, promise.resolve string, I can have that. And it will take the string and pass it as in this position, in the x position here, to the function that gets evaluated here. It will return the value plus one and then log the result. Who can tell me what this will print out? Everyone's watched Gary Bernhardt's what talk. <laughs> so that's, that's the semantic around then. Whatever you resolve inside a promise will be available to the next dot then. And from then on, anything that is returned from something inside a dot then function will be wrapped in a promise and passed to the next dot then call. Well, unless. Who can guess what six does? So six is obviously the inverse of five. Six rejects the promise. So we're right back to the, uh, the syntax of how we handle an error. Um, I'm going to introduce a new, uh, a new syntax here, and I'm going to catch that error. And I catch the error, and I call console.error, uh, error, error, x. And now when I run that, I get the error message and I get six back out. So dot catch is almost equivalent to the second parameter in a dot then call. This is the same as if I had done this. I have dot then, no way to handle a valid result, uh, resolution of the promise, but I do have an error handler. So these are the same kind of constructs. Cool, seven. So this one we've explained, we've seen dot then, we've seen passing a log to dot then. And we've seen using a second parameter to dot then to print out when a promise rejects. What about uh, in this case? So what will get printed by nine? Anyone guess? What? Unhandle? Yeah. So that. Can anyone, can everyone see why nine is going to show an unhandled exception? See, see of blank faces. That's right. So when you use a promise, and you pass it a dot then method. And inside that dot then method, you use two functions, a resolve and a reject. The reject cancel, uh, catches any errors that occurred inside the promise computation or inside previous computations inside dot then and dot catch blocks. But it won't catch an error occurring in the same dot then block. I keep hitting my trackpad. Um, so when this throws an error, this doesn't catch it because they occur at the same step. So when I call this, oh, sorry, didn't save. When I call this, we see an unhandled promise rejection error again. So this is all expected, this is good. What about now? We're gonna see an unhandled promise exception error? No, because dot then runs, throws a new error, and that error is picked up by the next dot catch. So this is actually an important uh, semantic. This is very different to how callbacks would work. If we had a callback function that took a callback whoop, and somehow inside here threw an error, the callback doesn't get called, right? We throw an error and the error bubbles up through the stack somehow. We could do this. And callback with the error. And now the error will get called by the callback because we caught it inside the function. Semantically, what a promise does inside a dot then statement, if for whatever reason your computation or your function inside the dot then throws an error, it will get caught, caught by the promises, 
and passed into whatever the next dot catch statement is. That might be a dot catch, that might be a dot then with a second parameter. These are the two, so what will happen here? It'll throw that error. The error will be passed into the handle error function. If the handle error function throws an error or rejects a promise in any way, that'll then get passed to the next dot catch, and so on and so on and so on. For a long time, this was the only way of uh, propagating uh, promise chains when you had a catch and you wanted to log out that something happened, but you didn't want to swallow the error. You would, inside a dot catch, you would log out the error, and then you would throw a new, you would throw the error again. And that would continue all the way down the chain in multiple places. You'd have logs all over the place of the same error message occurring, just at different places. If you were really unlucky, somewhere in your chain someone did this. Which means that you lose your stack at every place that someone propagates this, uh, this message. So, okay, so let's, uh, let's step past that. Cool, so 11. We're halfway there, so-so. What will this do? So 11 is a function. It logs out whatever the parameter that was passed to it is, and then we have a promise that resolves with a parameter. So what will this print? Uh, 11, sorry, 11 dot then. What does that print? 11, 12? Yep. 11, 12. Cool. Looking at this, who wants to hazard a guess where a promise's internal computation takes place? Does it take place inside the same event loop? Does it take place in the next uh, set of event loops? Hands up for the same event loop. No one. Hands up for the next event loop. Okay? So in that case, what would we expect, what, what would we expect this to print? So console.log. So what do we expect 12 to print? Nick says the same. Yeah, promise construct is guaranteed to be synchronous. Promise construct is guaranteed to be synchronous. Anyone else have an opinion? I think it's wrong. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Not possibly. I got for as I can. Okay, so reading through, reading through the function that we have, we enter at 12, we call 12 with some argument, and we log out the argument. We then construct a new promise, and we give it a callback, resolve, reject. Inside the callback that we give it, we check if x is greater than or equal to 2. If it is, we print larger. If it's not, we print smaller. And then we resolve. So this is going to do... 12 larger 12. Same, right? So this looks like it should be synchronous, right? What about this? So look at 13. We're introducing a new piece of syntax here, promise.all. What promise.all does is it takes an array of promises, evaluates each of them in parallel, well, as close to parallel as you get in a single-threaded runtime. It will wait until all of them have said that they resolve or at least one of them has said that it rejects. And then it will call either dot then or dot catch with either the result of all of them in an array or the error of the first one to fail. Kind of opaque, probably not the, the easiest verbal description of a promise library. So what does this give us? Probably shouldn't have deleted 12 actually. Just put 12 back. And delete that. Whoop. Okay. So, what does. Alright. One smaller, two larger, one two. One smaller, two larger, one two, and undefined. Okay. So, that gives us exactly what we're expecting. So we see that this waits for 12.1 to finish evaluating, waits for 12.2 to finish evaluating, takes the results from both of them, unwraps them out of whatever they're wrapped in, puts them back into the next, puts them in an array, and calls the next function with that array. What about 14? 
What's 14 going to print out? I told you, I told you this got a... Uh... All right, does 14 print out one smaller one, three larger three? No, then goes to the next one. Does it print out one smaller three larger one three? Does it print out one three smaller larger one three? <laughs> one, one smaller three larger yes. and then two smaller ones. <laughs> Alright, let's see. Let's see and then I'll walk you through what it does. One smaller three larger one three. So to remind people, here we enter in the first promise. We enter in we call twelve with one. And we log one. We start a new promise. We check if one is greater than or equal to two. It isn't, so we print smaller. But now we enter the first time where we see deferred evaluation specifically. Resolve is a function that is called on next tick. What that means is that resolve is not called when you see it appear in the code. It actually gets deferred until the next run in, without going actually too deep into the event log and the micro task queues and all that kind of stuff. It gets deferred until the next loop of the event loop and then it gets executed in place. So even though this looks synchronous, resolve is actually a special function internal to a promise. It's not the function that you give dot then. It's an internal function special to the promise that calls the function that you give dot then on the next run of the event loop. So there is a guarantee that anything that takes place in a promise doesn't take place inside the same event loop where it's constructed. Am I done with 12? Yes. All right, cool. Get rid of 12 now. All right, 15. Who can tell me what 15 prints? Oh, sorry. <laughs> And who can tell me why promises are not monads? They don't taste like burritos, it's true. Rob Howard would be very upset with me right now. Um, okay, so who can, who can guess what 15 prints? Does this print promise? Does it print promise, 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 promise? Hmm? Okay, so... The interesting thing about promise resolution and the reason why promises are not monads is when you call this, it prints one. Even though you've nested promise four layers deep, the resolution algorithm goes, have I returned a value? Yes, no. Is the value that I've returned a promise? Yes, no. If the value that I've been returned is a promise, try and resolve that. Have I been re uh, returned a value? Yes, no. Is the value that I've been returned a promise? Yes, no. Try and resolve it, try and resolve it, try and resolve it, try and resolve it until eventually you end up with some uh, value. Or you throw an error somehow and you reject and you exit that entirely. The reason why that's not the same as monads is for a monad, the resolve method would have to return the inner promise, which you would then have to unwrap again into another promise, which you would have to unwrap again into another promise until eventually you ended up inside the value that you wanted to extract. So they're not monads, they're monad-like there was a really, really great GitHub issue. Uh, yes. Uh, talking about using pointed, I think, is that, he works at Atlassian, right? Uh, Puff, Puff and Fresh on GitHub, and his name actually escapes me. Yeah, he does. Brian McKenna. Yes, Brian McKenna. Uh, really, really good GitHub issue discussing why promises aren't monads. Cool, all right, so recapping everything we've done so far. We have a promise. We resolve it, and it resolves with the value 1. We take 1, and we inject it into the position here in the function that runs. We log 1, and we return x plus 1, which we wrap in a promise because we then, whatever we return from dot then, has dot then called on that value. We inject 2 into this position. We call console.log2, and we throw 2, which we catch. 3. So we then log 3 and we return 4. 4, which we inject into the dot then function and log, and then we return promise.resolve. But as we saw before, when you return promise.resolve from within a promise, 
or when you have multiple nested resolutions, it will unwrap all of them until it gets to a value and then rewrap it in one promise and return that. So we're left with promise.resolve 4 plus 1, I think it was, which gives us promise.resolve 5, which is unwrapped until we have 5 and then rewrapped in a promise, which we then take and we log and then we reject with, but rejections are also wrapped and unwrapped, so we reject with 6, which calls dot .catch, and finally we log 7. I think. I think my math is right there. I also, I used a lot of uh, function parameters that I don't actually use, which if I had a linter as part of this would not uh, let me do. So here we see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And that's what happens here. So dot then, dot then, dot catch, dot then, dot then, dot catch. You can see that if you return inside a dot then, it's passed to the next dot then. If you throw inside a dot then, it's passed to the next dot catch. If you return inside a dot catch, it's passed to the next dot then. If you return a promise that resolves inside a dot then, no matter how many times it's nested deep and no matter whether it has dot then appended to it, if it is a promise and you return it from inside a dot then, then it will be passed to the next dot then. Same rules apply to a reject. If you call a reject and you pass and you from within a dot then method or within a dot catch method, it will be passed to the next dot catch. Which brings us to async. Who's seen the async uh, syntax before? Cool, a few people. So this is semantically under the hood. This is just a promise. So we have a, a special keyword here, async. And async tags this function as something that inside it has a delayed uh, computable something. And if you have a function tagged with async, it gives you access inside that function to the await keyword. So what we have here is a function 17 that we're saying this is going to have some deferred evaluation inside it. And here we're saying promise.resolve is a deferrable, it's a promise. So a wait, wait for this promise to uh, evaluate, unwrap it, take out the value, pass that value into whatever is uh, executing that, uh, that promise, and then rewrap the entire thing in a promise. So 17, which resolves with one, is actually just a promise. Async by the compiler is turned into a promise and wrapped and unwrapped in a particular way. So if we have then console log, and if I've set up Babel the right way, we get one. So that's what that's doing under the hood. This is semantically the same as a lot of the functions we've seen up to this point that returns promise.resolve one. It also is the same as return new promise, resolve, reject, resolve with one. These are all uh, essentially interpreted in the same way. So 18, where we await a rejection, is the same thing. It's a promise that rejects. Skip over it. 19. So what we see here is the first major difference between the promise syntax and the async await syntax. Once we use async, we turn all deferrable code evaluation back into a uh, kind of synchronous looking code. And what that means is that the internals of that now use try catch again instead of dot then dot catch. So what this does is it runs 19, opens a try block, throws one immediately catches that, returns two. So if I have 19, but then also it's Emacs with Vim mode, so oh, not what I meant to do. Two. So we catch it and we return. If you return from within a catch in normal synchronous code, you just continue your evaluation. If you return from within a catch inside an async function, it is treated like a promise that resolves in some capacity. Same thing, I guess I copied that twice, never mind. So 21. So this is an example of using a wait to actually extract a value. So normally with the fetch API, if I wanted to fetch Google's homepage, I would call fetch http google.com and then I would call dot then response and I would go response dot json, which is really frustrating because then I lose all of the other metadata about the evaluation. But I've thrown away the status code and a bunch of other headers and all the metadata and I'm left with the json response or in this case actually the text response. And now I have some HTML and I can log it. But let's say I wanted to use the header information or let's say I wanted to use something more 
uh, like metadata about the response object. Inside here, I now have to do something like this. I essentially build a function that contains a closure or uses scope, and I do something like um, const HTML equals response.html, const uh, headers equals response.headers. Now let's say that HTML was actually a promise returning function. I'd have to do something like response.html.then HTML. And now if I want to use the headers, I have to use response.headers dot then headers and we're right back at the callback hell the the pyramid of doom where every time we want to do something nested that contains scope and like retains access to something in a higher scope than itself we nest another function deep so this gets kind of difficult to deal with kind of quickly instead we can do stuff like this const response equals a wait fetch const html equals a wait response dot text const headers equals a wait response dot headers. Now, by the way, I'm, I'm using a totally fictional API for fetch here. This is totally not the fetch API, but for lack of me coming up with a better thing in five minutes. Um, and what we get here is the response, although response comes from a promise and therefore is actually inside the interpreter, actually happening inside a dot then call, the interpreter will go, cool, that kind of looks synchronous, we'll extract a response out, we'll make it work here. And it's actually doing the same thing that I was doing up here, where we have fetch.then response.html, uh, response.text rather. Here we have the same thing. Response equals a wait fetch, so it assigns the result of the promise when it resolves into the, uh, the parameter here, into the variable here. And then we're able to use that as if it was normal synchronous code. And if for whatever reason it throws, we can catch it inside the async await function. I think there are, yeah, three more things. Okay, so again, we can see here that these things are just ordinary promises. Here we await 21 running. We then take the result of 21 and we slice it from 0 to 15 and then we log it. Um, if we turn that into fetch google.com uh, dot then response response dot text and we call 22. I think that should work. No, unhandled. Fetch is not defined because I undid fetch. By the way, don't use fetch, use Axios. It's much nicer. We can see here, these are the first 15 characters from the Google uh, index HTML. All right, let's get rid of 22. Let's talk promise resolution as a value. So I said at the beginning that promises are actually values. They're not functions. They're not anything kind of special or weird. They're just ordinary values inside JavaScript, ordinary classes and ordinary instances of that class. They do something interesting though. It, part of the spec is that a promise cannot resolve with different values. A promise, once it has resolved, when you call dot then on that promise, will always return the same value into the dot then. Now, we don't see that very often because for the most part, we end up writing promises like this, dot then do something, dot then do something else. We don't usually actually contain a reference to that promise and pass it into multiple places. But, what we see here is if we do const x equals 23, console, uh, we do x dot then console dot log, x dot then console dot log. It seems like this should log zero and then one, right? Plus plus is the uh, increment after you've given it to whatever the function you've called operator. De increment, yeah, increment. We see here we get zero, zero. The value resolved by a promise, in this case zero, is, for lack of a better word, cached or stored inside the promise instance. And every time you call dot then on that instance of a promise, it resolves with that value. There's no way to get another value out of a promise once it's resolved. And that's 24 as well. So yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>